What's up, y'all? <laughs> you know what time it is. It's about to be that time. Damn, son, where'd you find this? I didn't mean it. If you come back, I'll never be a pain in the butt again. I promise. Good night. And we're back. One Piece 1116 is out. And the message of mixed messaging continues. But with all of the connections to Alabasta, this is easily my favorite of the past few chapters. And I've got many thoughts that, you know, we're going to pile into several mini theories across the video and, you know, while connecting the dots on multiple through lines. So as always, like, comment, subscribe if you're feeling the vibe. Who was right? Who was wrong? Why didn't the Roger Pirates do anything but laugh? Roger and Rayleigh said that they were too early. And in this chapter, Rayleigh doesn't want Vegapunk spoiling the fun. But in a blink and you'll miss moment, Vegapunk tells us exactly how the end game of this story is going to go. He spoiled it for us. He said, the day will come when all of the answers are laid bare. And I warn you, that moment will happen when we reach the very precipice of the world's drowning. Now, I've interpreted this as Roger was potentially too early because the sea levels were not where they needed to be in order to accomplish whatever goal or plan Joy Boy and his team put in place 800 years ago. Joy Boy stored the weapons away for a reason. And I hope everybody packed a swimsuit because that means Luffy literally cannot save the world until it's very much underwater. What if Charlie's prophecy referred to Luffy actually being responsible for flooding the world? Either way, someone's going to have to tell Neptune to start prepping the Noah. Is this why Odin was so determined to open the borders of Wano? Is the amount of water contained within those borders enough to actually flood the world? Is that the price either Luffy or the world must pay in order to bring back Pluton? Vegapunk continues to focus on remaining neutral and not choosing a side while Rayleigh wants us to come to our own conclusions. Luffy may have to make a powerful choice. For the greater good. One that hurts a few to save the many. It's a very Thanos mindset, but I'm curious if that's what Oda is actually setting up here. Will Luffy be able to make that choice? If Luffy has a way to communicate with the world, I could see him in Luffy fashion saying something like, sorry guys, please get to higher ground or you know, in a boat because the only way to save the world is to flood everything. And even if you die, don't die, thanks. You know, I, I'd prefer if Luffy didn't have to make a choice like that and just dealt with the ramifications of the bad guy causing the flood, but it is an interesting narrative in either situation. And I trust Oda to handle it with the elegance and tiptoeing that it requires. I'm also glad that Oda had Vegapunk outsmart York. That was solid. Oda really turned Chapter 1116 into a love letter to the Alabasta Saga in many ways. We got our first true bit of information about the ancient weapons, and Oda didn't waste any time to make sure that the panel about the ancient weapons landed on a panel of Crocodile listening in. And why is this important or noteworthy? Because Crocodile was the first character to ever even say the word ancient weapon. We know about them because of him. What does Crocodile know? How does he know it? We've said it before, but I do believe Crocodile may have a connection to Mads by way of Dufeld. Their aesthetics are the same, the man funded Vegapunk, and Crocodile had the very first Vegapunk weapon we ever saw, Mr. Four's dog gun lasso. This tells me that Croc is still after that power, and Oda also made sure to hide where Crocodile is by blacking out the background behind him, following his fight with the three Seraphim sent to kill him which he obviously survived, escaped, or won against. He's likely on the new ship built for the Cross Guild, well on his way to becoming plot relevant once again. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Cobra's funeral had a level of detail and emotion that is always rare to get outside of flashbacks, so I'm glad that Oda didn't shy away from showing us this. We can see Igarum is putting Vivi on milk cartons, and Chaka is staring across the way, trying to understand why that guy is dressed like Pell. Yeah, I'm never going to change, guys. Hashtag Chaka can do it! Savage. On the hieroglyphs, you can see the guardian deities of Alabasta, the falcon and the jackal on either side of a sun. The falcon in Egyptian mythology represents the sun god Ra, and the jackal represents Anubis, the king of the underworld, essentially a yin and yang with the sun in the middle. Now, King Jay brought up in the stream and on Twitter the idea that Nefertari D. Lily may not be interred in the Alabasta tombs, but rather in Marijua. There was no written record of her, right? We get our first real glimpse of Lily via the photo in Pangaea Castle, and she's the spitting image of Vivi from what little we can see. Now, every time we have seen a funeral in the story, it has been met with these large, oversized photos over where they are buried. We saw this with Scarlet, Odahime, Cobra, and arguably Sindri, who wasn't buried, but her corpse was located in the same island as the giant photo in Hogback's collection. King Jay suggested that this is the proof that Lily could be buried in the castle. I feel like this tracks, though. We know Joy Boy and Lily lost 800 years ago, and if Emu and Lily had, say, an Anakin and Padme type of relationship, platonic or otherwise, I could see him going out of his way to collect Lily's corpse, which would tie into the Egyptian myth of Osiris that we've talked about, which involved Neftet going on a hunt for their loved one's corpse. Could Oda be reversing the gender roles here? What if it's really reassemble Lily and not reassemble Joy Boy? Further evidence for this is the way it is presented in volume form. If you're viewing this chapter on Viz or are from the future and are holding the volume in your hand, you're going to be able to see that the photos of Lily and Cobra are centered and mirrored on each page. A great point of foreshadowing if this idea ends up being true. And for the record, I do not believe in the body swap theories that Emu is Lily or Emu is Joy Boy. I would prefer if Emu is just Emu. The truth of Lelucia has made its way around the world, and Oda has made sure this landed on Moda the Milk Girl, and former resident of the island that shall not be named. He follows this panel with Vice Admiral Comiel, which is not random, but actually a connective tissue and thread between these characters, as Comiel was part of the G2 cover story with Ace, where he landed on Lelucia, met Moda, and delivered a message to G2, which is where Comiel is stationed. Lelucia would have been under the jurisdiction of G2, so Comiel definitely has a personal stake in hearing this, and could potentially be one of the marines that turns against the government by the time this message is over. And speaking of turning tides, we are definitively not getting Triple Cross Stussy, but I'm glad Oda took the time to explain that Stussy really did love working for the government and made friends. Kaku and Stussy shippers definitely cash out now, because I don't know if your stocks are going to get higher than this. I'm, I'm picturing Kaku and Stussy getting a farm after this for sure. Although I don't know how long they'll have it, how long that's going to last with all the flooding going on. Anyway, Sengoku and Suru are on the move, just as I predicted they would be after 1082. Their main goal will be to deal with Garp, but I expect them getting sidetracked since they also spoke about their interest dealing with the Cross Guild problem. Should Blackbeard learn that Garp isn't worth anything to the government, it would be interesting if Garp is sold to the Cross Guild and a mock execution is held by Buggy paralleling Logetown. Sengoku and Suru coming to stop this would also be interesting if Law ends up working with the Cross Guild to add another former warlord to their ranks. I would expect Law to side with Sengoku by the end of it due to the Corazon connection and the possibility that he could still be an undercover sword member. I'm not changing, guys. The last time we saw Law, he was swimming away with Beppo, and the following page would show Sengoku and Suru if you're reading it in volume form. So, we may learn what happened to Law very soon, or they may get rescued by Sengoku, which could lead Law to impel down instead if he is truly a pirate. Either way, if you want to know more about my thoughts with that, you can watch, you know, the Cross Guild Davy Backfight video or the recent discussion that I just had with Dak Sake on his second channel, Redacted. Link for that is below. Great discussion. The ancient robot is on the move, and I made a couple of interesting connections in this chapter. 
One, his eyes are activated and drawn the exact same way that Oda drew Zunisha's eyes in the Joy Boy Has Returned panel in Chapter 1043. Are they each under the same curse? Is that their connection? Interestingly, the ancient robot looks like an ancient Oni. Now, I never noticed this until I saw in this chapter, like an actual front view of the ancient robot standing, and I put it together. If you compare the size and proportions of the robot to the proportions of Ors or Ors Jr., you've got same horns, same torso build, same forearms, etc. Could this originally have been armor for the Void Century ancestor of Ors, the first continent puller? Is there circuitry inside, or is a soul trapped in the robot like Alphonse Elric? <laughs> I'm excited to see how this ties in, and shout out to Groat Stonks in the stream because he caught a big W this week by suggesting that the transmission snail is inside the robot. This could have happened in Vegapunk's introduction when he was partially phased into the robot. Accidental or not, it ties the climax of the arc to Vegapunk's introduction, which is great. And RIP to anybody who was hoping Dragon would be helping with the relay. We will watch your career with great interest. Either way, we're set to get a 5v1 next week with the Gorosei targeting the ancient robot. I just hope, as I've been saying and reiterating Rayleigh's words this chapter, that I don't want Vegapunk spoiling the fun for Robin. If Robin can get her hands on the snail and start transmitting what she knows about the world, then I'll be satisfied. Robin needs to drop the name of the ancient kingdom. That's not Vegapunk's role, Sorry, it's just not. But what does Akainu know? The official dialogue in chapter 1116 has Akainu saying, you're really going to tell them everything, Vegapunk? Implying that he might know everything. Is there a dossier that you get when you become Fleet Admiral? Like when a president gets sworn into the United States and learns the truth about aliens? For that matter, what does Sengoku know? It's very curious, and I wonder if any of this has to do with Dragon. We've talked about how Dragon must know things to make him so dangerous to the world government. Dragon and Akainu are the exact same age. Did Akainu and Dragon learn the same information, perhaps, at the same time coming up in the Marines, and take two different paths with said information? Is that why Akainu is so mad at Dragon? Why he calls Luffy Dragon's son with such animosity? There's a lot to unpack there. And that's going to wrap things up, guys. Looking forward to 11.17 next week. Thanks for all of your support and engagement. The last video didn't reach the heights of the Luffy lineage video, but it did better than any other analysis this year. So we're definitely making a dent in the algorithm, and that is thanks to you guys. So if you've made it to the end of the video, and you also believe that Pell should be dead, comment hashtag Chaka can do it. Because <laughs> this chapter really like hammers that in anyway take care everyone and like comment subscribe if you are feeling the vibe savage